The January 6th attack delayed the certification of the 2020 election results. It also led to the largest criminal investigation in the history of the U.S. Justice Department. Federal prosecutors have charged more than 1,200 people connected to January 6th. 1,100 of those have been charged with entering a restricted federal building accused of illegally parading or demonstrating in the Capitol. About 450 are accused of violence, like assaulting, resisting, or impeding law enforcement. Let's bring in CBS News congressional correspondent Scott McFarland. He's been on this case from the very beginning. Scott, so what does 2024 hold for these prosecutions? There are more arrests still to be made, but at this point, the Department of Justice seems to be seeing some type of end game. They're now estimating about 80 more people they're looking for who had some violent activity, some violent criminal activity on January 6th. That's quite a reduction, Catherine, from the estimates they were giving in 2023 and 2022 that there may be hundreds and hundreds more. That notwithstanding, they still have open cases that have been lingering for years. They still have hundreds of cases they have to prosecute from soup to nuts. It's going to take time. And oh, by the way, this is all going through the same federal courthouse at the same time, which only has so much bandwidth. That's right. Now, let's talk about these pipe bombs that were planted uh, at the RNC and the DNC the night before January 6th. Uh, the FBI is offering a $500,000 reward, which frankly is the kind of reward you'd expect for a major terrorist yep. uh, figure. Why is this the missing link in the prosecution? I think... But the police have been unequivocal that those devices distracted them at a sensitive moment, derailed their efforts to respond to the riot itself during the early moments of the attack. They were a problem. The FBI has also made this claim, and they continue to do so, that those things could have killed somebody and that the suspect responsible for those is still a danger to the public. This could be one of the biggest cover-ups in American history, and it seems as if the FBI was aware that it was happening all along. Now, you guys might be thinking that this is kind of all based on conspiracy theories and all that, I get it, but once you find out a little bit more about this, the more it actually starts to make sense. You're gonna need to keep an open mind for this one because there's this huge update with the January 6th Capitol riot or Capitol pipe bomb fiasco, and the most probable suspect who planted said bombs within the area, yeah, you're, you're, you're gonna be shocked on this one. Now you might be asking, was this a cover up? Did the FBI purposely keep information from us? Was the Secret Service in on this thing? Well, we're gonna try to answer all of that one in just a second, check this out. The night before the attack on the Capitol, someone walked around this building, the Democratic National Committee headquarters, seemingly scoping it out before leaving a pipe bomb. It happened between the hours of 7.30 and 8.30 that night. The FBI believes that same person also left a pipe bomb outside the Republican National Committee. But here we are three years later, and the FBI has no idea who that person is. One might describe the video as ghostly. You cannot see the person's eyes or even get a good look at the face. Is it a man or a woman? The person does have a distinctive walk, but Make no mistake about it, FBI agents believe this person is dangerous, carrying in a backpack and then leaving two pipe bombs. Now, do any of you guys think that it's normal for the FBI to not have any leads as to who this person is after three whole years? You should also know that they have extensive footage and evidence that could probably lead to this person, but yet nothing has been found out yet. Well, the investigators say they still don't know who did this, and they're hoping that these two new videos can help generate some valuable tips. The first one shows the suspect walking up to and sitting down on a park bench near the headquarters of the Democratic National Committee. Now, you don't actually see the person place the pipe bomb. The bomb is planted later after this surveillance video, but you see the suspect sitting down there at the park bench, reaching into a backpack, which the suspect was carrying, and uh, uh, taking out what appears to be a phone. You see the, the suspect sort of illuminated here in just a second from the light from the cell phone uh, as the suspect apparently looks at the phone, then puts it back in the backpack and walks away. The suspect was wearing a face mask, gray hoodie, black and white gray Nike Air Max Speed Turf shoes and gloves in addition to carrying a backpack. Now, all this happened between 7.30 and 8.30 p.m. on January 5th the night before the Capitol riot. The second video is a map showing the route that the FBI believes the suspect took uh, from the Democratic National Committee there on the left side of the screen, and then the other bomb that was placed at the headquarters of the Republican National Committee, both of these uh, near the Capitol, 
the Republican National Committee on First Street, the Democratic National Committee on South Capitol, both of them in Southeast Washington. As you guys saw, there is a lot of footage. They even have an idea as to the exact steps that this suspect took in planting these pipe bombs, but still nothing. Even former FBI agents are kind of stumped as to why they haven't found this person given that they have everything that they need in order to find him or her. One of which lies in the bomb itself as experts say that this is key in figuring out exactly where this bomb came from. What about the bomb itself? Don't bombs have signatures? Shouldn't we be able to tell some information from the bombs themselves? Absolutely. Every destructive device has a signature. And it's something that is pretty much unique to the person who put that bomb together. The components of the bomb, I've worked bombing cases in the past where that the components have actually led us to the neighborhood of where the bomber was. Uh, here, you know, the, the FBI has the components, they've gone through them, um, but they still need that, that one tip that's gonna match them back. That's a big deal, right? And I should also say that the FBI is offering a lot of money to get this guy caught, which leads me to believe that this new report that shows that a former FBI agent already found this guy, at least allegedly, but that he was stopped short of interviewing him or her for unknown reasons. So Kyle Serafin, as I said, was a former FBI agent, said that he and the FBI surveillance team found a guy who matched what they were looking for through a Metro fare card and a license plate. Both of these were seen through security footage, and the fact is, that both of these items were traced back to just one person. Now, you would think that this would be just kind of like an open and shut case, right? But that's not quite how this works. You see, Kyle's team staked out this guy's house for days, but when it came time to confront and interview this guy, the FBI suddenly blocked their way. Hmm, wonder why? After multiple denied attempts, Kyle and his team was then reassigned to other targets connected to January 6th. I guess they were doing too good of a job, right? Serafin also claimed that the FBI can telephonically capture and triangulate your phone in real time. And like the footage that you saw a while ago, we saw the guy literally whip out his phone and use it within clear sight of a camera. There's also something you guys should know. These bombs were not functional and they wouldn't detonate at all even if they tried. Kind of alluding to the fact that these were mostly used to distract rather than destroy. But here's something that's going to blow your mind. Figuratively, of course. So get this, right? So the Metro card that the backpack guy guy used and the license plate that's somehow connected to him belongs to a retired Air Force Chief Master Sergeant. This Air Force Chief Master Sergeant who's now working as a contractor with security clearance. Can you believe this? Now, I'm not saying that this is the guy. I mean, maybe he's not, but it's kind of weird as to how this wild goose chase led to someone who actually worked for the government. And on that note, you guys remember that there's another backpack guy, right? The one who warned the Secret Service about the other pipe bomb? I learned that uh, backpack guy, January 6th backpack guy, not to be confused with January 5th backpack person, uh, backpack guy was a uh, non-uniform, you know, plain clothes police officer in, in, you know, in the employ of the Capitol Hill police. Wow, so that's why he was very calm with reporting that he saw a bomb. Even the Secret Service was very chill when they got out of their cars. There was no panic, there was no urgency. Some critics say that it was kind of like a signal because things were already happening at the Capitol, so this provided a smoke screen of some sorts. But again, it's up to you guys to decide what happened here. As far as I'm concerned, I'm gonna do my best to provide you guys with the information. That's all I can do. I wanna thank you guys so much for always liking the videos. Thanks for subscribing, and I'm gonna see you guys on the next one.